All right, everybody. Uh, congratulations on excellent performance on speaking fern. You're now all fluent in fern. Let's move on to meet some particular groups of ferns. And we're going to start off with the eusporangiates, the eusporangiate ferns. And so going back again, just to our reproductive features, uh, I've already introduced you a bit to a leptosporangium. So these are these thin walled sporangia. They come from a single initial cell and they usually contain 64 spores. Regardless, they don't contain very many spores uh, and they look kind of like this. So there's a fair amount of variation. The leptosporangiate ferns, which I've circled here, are themselves a clade. So this is going back again to some of the terminology we learned in the very beginning, what are ferns. So a group that has a single common ancestor, which is back somewhere around here, and is in that ancestral lineage that the leptosporangium evolved. Prior to that, so everywhere else on this tree, uh, the organisms had uh, what's called a eusporangium. I'm gonna tell you what that is in just one second. So there's only one relatively small group of organisms that has a leptosporangium. Everything else has a eusporangium. And that includes, so this is what a eusporangium looks like. Um, it's a sporangium that is thick walled instead of thin walled. It's formed from uh, several initial cells uh, and it contains many spores. Lots of variation, but, uh, but it differs from a leptosporangium in all of those characteristics. And that's the type of sporangium that most of this phylogeny has, including all of the ancestral lineages back here. And some of those ancestral lineages have uh, extant living relatives that still have eusporangia. Uh, so they have continued to evolve and they now are present with us today. And so these lineages here, we call uh, the eusporangiate ferns. And they're what I'll talk about briefly in this session. Um, so we're gonna switch orientation for a second. This is a phylogeny again, but this time just of ferns. Um, and so we're going to focus on the eusporangiates, which are these lineages I've colored in red. Um, and just sort of give us a very quick tour through, through each of these groups. First of all, we'll start with uh, the equisetum lineage. The equisetum is probably familiar to, to many people. These are the horsetails. Um, what might be surprising is that we're including them in a discussion about ferns because people often think of equisetum as, as not being a fern. But think back to the lecture, uh, the, the module on what is a fern, equisetum satisfies both of those criteria. It is a member of that clade, that branch of the evolutionary tree. Uh, it also has the same biological features. It doesn't have flowers or fruit. It has the same sorts of um, sporangial arrangement, sort of. Um, it has that same independent gametophyte. Here's a uh, gametophyte of an equisetum. Uh, so independent gametophyte and independent sporophyte. It has vascular tissue. Um, it has all the features of a fern. It's just a very, very strange looking one and, and relatively evolutionary distinct from the rest of ferns to be fair. It's a very unusual group of organisms. Uh, among the things that makes equisetum unusual are the fact that they have very little by way of leaves. Almost the entire plant of an equisetum is, is stem. So all of these things here and that big one in the middle, those are all stems. All that's left of the leaves are these little sheaths, these little teeth along the sheath. So this is the what's left of an equisetum leaf. Um, they're sporangia arranged in a funny way, kind of on these weird upside down umbrellas. Um, and they produce really interesting spores that are green. They have chlorophyll on them, which is unusual. And they have these appendages called elaters that help them disperse. So, uh, as the humidity changes, these sort of arms flop about and that helps the spores disperse. So a very unusual group of plants. Um, nowadays, only represented by approximately 15 species worldwide. But most of those species are themselves very widely distributed. So not very many species, but a very wide distribution. Historically, uh, back in the Carboniferous, for example, 200 to 300 million years ago or so, they were super dominant. Uh, they were one of the major lineages, um, most ecologically important lineages, including large tree-like forms such as this Calamites. Uh, so Calamites is an extinct relative of modern day horsetails. Um, and I wanted to include this slide just to emphasize how important uh, the equisetum group was uh, in prehistory. A lot of our fossil fuels, for example, come from members of this group. 
but also just to give a sort of a side comment about paleobotany and what a challenging uh, field of research it is, because you don't typically get an entire plant fossilized. Instead, you get all these different portions, and it's sort of like a, a detective work or a jigsaw puzzle to try to infer what the whole organism looked like based upon these individual snapshots of various uh, organs. And so on the left is, is sort of a reconstruction of what Calamites looks like. Uh, and then around the edge are some of the fossil evidence that was used to, to form that reconstruction. Uh, so a long extinct member of the horsetail lineage. Um, horsetails are still, as I said, uh, around some of them are fairly big. So here's a tropical species uh, with quite a large horsetail. And here in Western North America, we have some ones I think are pretty big. When I first, as, as uh, Stacey said, I'm from Southern Canada, from Southern Ontario. And when I first saw the giant Western horsetail, uh, the one that's pictured there on the left, I was blown away. It's such an amazing, uh, a huge horsetail uh, for me, because I'm most familiar with horsetails look kind of like this, that are maybe two or three inches tall. Um, and so there's quite a quite a range of, of horsetail size. This is Equisetum scorpoides, a common uh, Eastern, oh, well, common slightly more Northern horsetail. So that's the horsetails. Um, the next group I'll mention, uh, it has two families in it, um, the Silotaceae and the Ophioglossaceae, uh, which is up here with the, the PS and the, whatever the symbol this is, and I'll do those each in turn. I'll start with the Ophioglossaceae, which may be familiar to many people. These are the great ferns uh, or the adder's tongue ferns. Um, they are, are um, moderately diverse, there's somewhat over 100 species of them, uh, mostly tropical, but also quite a few temperate ones, uh, especially in this genus here, the true botrychium, the true moonworts. Um, these are really unusual in that what looks, the whole plant that we see here, what looks like uh, maybe multiple different leaves is in fact one single leaf um, that is divided into a fertile port, port uh, sorry, the fertile part, part that produces the spores, bears the eusporangia, and a sterile part. Um, so like that polysticum we saw in our last activity, this is an example of an individual leaf that is dimorphic. It has a fertile and a sterile portion. Um, here's a uh, sort of a look at what some of these look like uh, in the wild. So here is Ophioglossum californicum. So this is a adder song that's native to here to California. Um, and the eusporangia are clustered in this part of the leaf up here. And here is a true botrychium, uh, uh, maybe botrychium lunaria, um, more of an alpine and northern species. Um, and again, here's that, that fertile part of the leaf, with the eusporangia, and here is the sterile part. Really interesting plants. So I'm not going to talk about them very much, uh, but very fascinating biology. They are most closely related to this other very strange group of plants called the Silotales. Um, we're only going to really talk about this one genus, Silotum. Uh, there's only two genera in total. It's a very small group. Silotum looks like this up here in the top, kind of a bunch of green twigs. And we take a little bit of a closer look. Here's a whole plant. Uh, and here's a close up showing these yellow synangia. So it has its eusporangia fused three at a time into these specialized structures called synangia. Um, here's a close up. So here's a synangium with its three few sporangia. Here's this weird little bifid appendage that we think is all that's left of the leaves of uh, uh, Silotum. Uh, so Silotum basically has no leaves. It has no roots. Um, it just is this sort of branchy, twiggy thing that bears these uh, um, uh, synangium. 